So uh, last week we discussed the methods for unsupervised learning and this week we will come to a topic uh, that is mostly conceptual in nature. So uh, we will have uh, some math today, though uh, not very much. And But we will glean some uh, useful notions. On the one hand we will see why it helps to project data in a nonlinear fashion to higher dimensions such that it does become linearly separable in this higher dimensionality and the fact that this is so is established uh, not just by empiricism but by the function counting theorem which we will look at in some detail today. Uh, beyond that uh, we will look at neural networks as a method uh, that exploits this uh, technique uh, for starters, we will look at the perceptron, which is the building block of neural networks. And uh, we will see a technique that is not used so widely nowadays. So uh, most people rather use, for example, the support vector machine that we will see uh, one week later. But it is uh, traditionally very important as having been the first technique in uh, what, what used to be called artificial intelligence nowadays uh, people shy from this word uh, I think for two reasons one is that uh, the longer we work on it the harder we see the uh, the, the more we see how hard it is to match uh, really human intelligence and uh, uh, even today we haven't accomplished what uh, our predecessors promised uh, we would do within 10 years uh, in the 60s uh, so maybe uh, we are a little more uh, modest nowadays uh, but another reason is that uh, the the word has been uh, burned in some sense. So uh, in neural networks in particular, there have been uh, renewed waves of hype followed by disillusion and uh, lack of funding and uh, hatred and uh, you know generally bad feelings uh, followed by a renewed hype and so on. And uh, to give you the very rough chronology of this, uh, this field started in the late 50s when people built the first learning elements, some of those actually with uh, analog computation. And uh, if any of you have too much time, there's a nice book called uh, Speaking Neural Networks, which has interviews with the, the pioneers of those days. And uh, one of those pioneers here recounts a story uh, how they needed a high resistance uh, element and uh, well they didn't have it in their uh, in their case so he, he put a pencil and uh, drew a, a line on a sheet of paper to get his high resistance uh, element that, that he needed and so that was uh, almost even before the day of transistors transistors sorry um, the predecessors of transistors were called the predecessors of yeah relays huh? so uh, actually relays were around but but the very first uh, of these analog computers were built even without those, and not to mention transistors. Transistors came later. So anyway, um, that was, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about these tubes or whatever they were called, yeah? tubes. Sorry? Yeah, these vacuum tubes. I, I, I'm not sure what the, what the proper term even is. Yeah, and so, in those late 50s, uh, the first autonomous learning elements were built. And uh, there was uh, gigantic enthusiasm, boundless enthusiasm. Uh, those were anyways uh, the days, you know, World War II was over uh, when uh, people believed in uh, technology and progress and uh, that, uh, you know, cars became enormous in those days and it was thought that uh, every problem could be solved by machines or uh, computers were not yet around so uh, uh, people in those days talked about I'm trying to remember the word word that has disappeared in the meantime not technometrics what was it called uh, cybernetics thank you <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so so back then you could get a degree in cybernetics. <laughs> and uh, actually in the East, the name has lived on a bit longer than in the West. But, but you know, have you heard of cybernetics? No? Yeah, 
Yeah, but that was another cyber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So thank you very much. Cybernetics was the thing of the day. And uh, so people uh, were, you know, sending the first rockets uh, into space, not quite to the moon yet. And they were fascinated by this idea of having machines that learn by themselves. And it was the early days of science fiction and so on. It's a very exciting time. And then uh, this uh, lasted for a few years. And then uh, people found that these uh, early learning machines, perceptrons and the like, they could not solve more difficult learning problems. Uh, and in particular, there was a book by Minsky and Papad in the late 60s, um, which everybody's citing and nobody, including me, is reading. Um, but, <laughs> but this book stated that there are some, uh, well, I'm mentioning that because the book is frequently miscited, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> uh, so uh, this book showed that uh, certain more difficult learning problems could not be solved with a perceptron uh, alone. And uh, that led to a decline of the whole field and, and so on. So there was uh, AI lay dormant for uh, what some people call the first AI winter. And uh, that lasted until people, uh, until it became more widely known that you can combine multiple perceptrons to build more complicated nonlinear machines, the artificial neural networks that we will talk about today. And uh, that was uh, all great, but then people didn't uh, find a good way of parametrizing those. And then again, the field lay dormant for, for a while until uh, the a mechanism to train these machines, the backpropagation algorithm, became more widely known. And this backpropagation algorithm uh, is one example of a technique that had been invented many years before, but it just hadn't gained widespread attention. So people now had backprop and they were all excited again. And uh, this even happened in my own lifetime. And uh, why was it so successful? I think for two or three reasons. Uh, on the one hand, there was uh, a loose biological relation. So it was a network of neurons and it sounded pretty much like what our brain is doing. So people thought that this was biologically inspired or similar to what we're doing. Uh, a second reason was that, um, well, engineers could use it. So now there was existing software and you could use it uh, to solve uh, um, you know, an existing uh, problem. And the third reason I have forgotten. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was quite popular for a few years uh, until people realized that in spite of practical propagation, it's difficult to train these optimally. It uh, is a method uh, that has many local minima and if you train, you're susceptible to end up in one of the local minima. And uh, in many ways, support vector machines, which we'll discuss next week, are the natural successor of uh, these neural networks. However, um, some people use them to this day and uh, experts use them uh, with great results. So you still can get uh, state of the art or even overall best performances in a few very hard computer vision and uh, uh, language analysis tasks. But overall, um, the method it seems to uh, uh, not work that well in the hands of uh, beginners. Uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, uh, it is important conceptually and it has been extremely important historically and this is why we're studying them 